Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Dear saints, today's sermon text, I know you're probably expecting it to be on the wedding in Cana. That's what I normally preach on. I thought I'd throw you a curveball. It's on Romans 12. Romans 12 today from the epistle 6 to 16. I'm going to reread it for you. However, I'm also going to read the entire chapter. We're going to read, we're going to start at the beginning of chapter 12 and go all the way through the end. The thing kind of preaches itself. The Holy Spirit inspired St. Paul to teach the church, first the church at Rome, and then all the way down to us, the church here in Ferndale in Humboldt County. A valuable lesson. A lesson in how to live as the Christians we have been made into. The Christians we are. And so, Romans 12, I appeal to you, therefore, well, already we have to ask the question, why for? <laughs> why are you appealing to us, Paul? Well, he had just said in Romans eleven thirty six 36, to him, to, gl- to God, be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, because of the glory of God, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, and literally, in the original language, that means your rational service. Rational service to God. Do not be conformed to this world, he continues, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Your rational being. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. Discerning, testing, comparing. So don't conform to the world, literally to the age that you're in, the eon in the Greek. Don't conform to the the zeitgeist, the spirit of your age. And that's going to change depending on when you live. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. For rational service to God. Be transformed by God's gracious activity of renewing you in the waters of holy baptism to be the new man you are, Paul says. That, by testing, comparing, judging, I know, judging things, analyzing things around you, you may discern the will of God. That is, those things that are acceptable and perfect. Paul says, be scientists. Use knowledge. Know when something is red or blue and be able to tell the difference, right? This is, you can see already how science would emerge, blossom out of the church. Not scientism, but true seeking of knowledge as we discern the will of God, testing, judging, comparing, These are things we do to have knowledge. What tool, what tool has the Lord given us to do this theologically, spiritually, biblically, scripturally? Scripture, but what tool in Scripture? We have the gospel. We also have the law, and we have them rightly distinguished between the two, don't we? Discern between the two. We have in the law the Ten Commandments. We use these Ten Commandments not to beat each other up over the head, but to know what is the will of God. To know what He says. And even though the Lord has fulfilled the commandments, fulfilled the law, He hasn't kicked it to the curb. We still know what Dad wants us to do in Dad's family. We still know that honoring father and mother is a good thing. We still know that murdering is a bad thing. None of that has changed. What's changed is that the Lord has kept it for us because we can't. As baptized Christians, we've been given eyes to see and ears to hear what God says is good and acceptable to him. And so we now can read the commandments in a third use is the way the reformers talk about it. The Christian reads the commandments knowing this is the behavior I should have. I don't have all the time, but I should have. It's what dad would have me be like if I was like Jesus. 
The Holy Spirit has given you a mind to recognize that. And so then, as Christians, you actually want to live according to God's Ten Commandments. They are no longer a burden, but they are a curb, a guide, and they are what you desire to carry out. Or to say it another way, we now know the will of God and we can submit to it. It is not good for me to lie about my neighbor. I don't do that because I'm going to submit to God. God says not to do that. Not because I, Jiminy Cricket said not to do that in a Disney movie or something, but God said not to do it. Praise be to God for his, his commandments, his law. They instruct us. They are, they are, as Paul says, a pedagogue, a teacher, a rule. They teach you how to behave. Are you able to do it perfectly because of the law? No. Paul also tells us, now that we have the law, we know exactly how we sin, <laughs> that we don't do it rightly. And then we turn to the gospel, and we know that we are forgiven. For by the grace given to me, continuing in Romans 12, if you're following along, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And this is what the commandments do, isn't it? They cut us off at the knees. You think you're all that in a bag of chips? Read the Ten Commandments. But we are to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God assigned. With sober judgment. Each of us concludes that we're nothing apart from Christ. If I am thinking clearly with a sober mind, and judging what God's word says for my, about my behavior, I recognize, apart from Jesus, I'm nothing but dirt, lifeless, dead in my trespasses, as scripture says. My most righteous deeds, as Isaiah proclaims, are nothing but a polluted garment, apart from Christ. It's Jesus Christ who gives us life, who quickens this dirt and makes it into something worthwhile. It's Jesus Christ who takes our sinfulness and makes us righteous, holy, good, acceptable to God, perfect in him. He did that for you in your baptism. When you were connected to his perfect life and his selfless sacrifice in your place on the cross, he gave you forgiveness of your sin. He, he clothed you with the robe of righteousness, his body, his blood, as he died for you on the cross. And so now when your father looks at you, he sees perfect Mary, perfect Peggy. I hope he sees perfect Ty. <laughs> I know he does in the gospel of Christ. That's how he sees every believer. And so we don't think highly of ourselves at all. Not with sober judgment. About whom do we think highly? Jesus Christ, our King. We've been made members of His body. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ. Notice the members don't get even named here. Who do we think highly about? Jesus, Christ, he gets named. And individually, members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to the faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in simple generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. That means literally let love be without hypocrisy. Let it be whole and complete, genuine, pure. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Paul's telling us to live like Christ because Christ is the only one who can do this. He can, he's the only one who can love genuinely and he's the only one who can purely abhor what is evil. You know your love suffers from hypocrisy, don't you? I hope you do. 
My love suffers greatly from hypocrisy. My heart's sin. The old Adam within me it taints what should be pure love all the time. I don't always love and I don't always abhor what is evil. Usually, this is how it works, usually, what we love and what we abhor is so weirdly connected to the things that benefit us. We love and we abhor based on what we want out of life. It becomes self-serving. I don't know why I'm still a Miami Dolphins fan because they never win. I, don't, I, I should abhor them, but I keep loving them for some reason. I don't know. But we tend to love that thing which is going to return goodness to us. And we tend to abhor and call something evil that which is obviously for our position in life not what we want. It becomes self-serving and subjective. And so we know that's wrong. This is why we need Jesus. He genuinely loves us us and he genuinely loves our neighbors through us his motivation is completely selfless he is a sacrifice his motivation isn't smeared by a secret motive to get something for himself out of the loving or the abhorring that's how we operate thanks be to god jesus died for us because none of us have a genuine non-hypocritical love within us apart from him. And none of us truly abhor evil as we ought. We abhor other people's evil pretty easily. We protect our own regularly, don't we? We treasure our own evil. We wrap it up and we safely deposit it in the back of our hearts. And then when no one's looking, we entertain it as opportunity allows. And sometimes we find others who have the same evil that they are protecting and we can bring it out of the closet and we can entertain it together. And if we get enough of that going on, we can start labeling good as evil and evil as good. And we can get away with it. Not Jesus. He doesn't work like this. He loves and he abhors perfectly. He held and he holds fast to what is good, to the will of his Father, our Father, your Father in baptism as you are adopted into Christ and into the family. And because of that, Jesus has made us conduits of his love, not our love, his love. He's also made us conduits of his aberration. I think that's a word. If not, it is now. Paul says to the Christians in Rome, love one another with brotherly affection. He's talking to the church here. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. How do we serve the Lord? He doesn't need our service. He can get anything done anytime he wants. We serve the Lord by serving our neighbor. It's our neighbor who needs our works. And so my commission as a called servant of the Lord is by speaking to you. And your commission as a called baptized Christian to your neighbors is to speak the truth of the Lord to them. God already knows what's good. He already knows what's evil. But our neighbors don't. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. We are a people who rejoice. We don't get beaten down. We can have seasons of that, sure. But we know the objective truth. Christ has won the victory on the cross. They can't take away your birthday. No one. You are baptized into Christ. As I like to tell the kids, do you have a belly button? It is a scar that reminds you of what? Your birth. birth. No one can take away your, your birthday. They can't take away your belly button. You have a spiritual scar as well from your baptismal birthday. Only you can walk away from that and pretend like it's not there. No one can take that away from you. And so we rejoice in the hope of eternal life with Christ Jesus. Be patient in tribulation, Paul says. Long-suffering in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. This is how we get through everything. Contribute to the needs of the saints 
the church and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Again, we praise Jesus for doing this to us from the cross. He blessed us when he had all rights to curse us. We should have been cursed because of our sin. That would have been just. But we've been blessed by Christ's death. In the great exchange, Jesus took on all of our sin and he gave us all of his perfect life. What a blessing. Every Christian, every repentant follower of Jesus has been blessed by the grace of God apart from any merit of, on his own. No works of ours can get us to heaven. It's all pure mercy from the Messiah. It's the blessing over curse that we bring to the world, to all the world, but especially to those who persecute us. We bless them. We bring them water in the midst of fire, showing no partiality, not loving hypocritically, but loving genuinely. And not from ourselves, but from Christ and the cross. Rejoice with those who rejoice, he says. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another, church. We are, after all, all brothers in Christ Jesus. Family. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Don't think too high of yourself. Get low. Plan for yourself when the Lord comes back that he'll find you sleeves rolled up on your knees, dirty, grimy, gunky, working with those who need your help. Your hands covered in the, the blood of other people's sins. Get your hands dirty with the lowly. Get in the fray. Serve them. Don't be one of these princess types. I mean, I know I look pretty good up here in this regalia. But this is not what we strive for. Fine cloth. Think about John the Baptist. Mm -mm. Give me uh, rough, coarse clothing and send me into the wilderness, Lord. No pillow to lay my head. Never be wise in your own sight, he says. Reminds me of what Scripture says, but I hear it more from Tom than I hear it from Scripture. Tom says, we don't lean on our own understanding, and I need to hear it all the time. Thanks be to God. We do not lean on our own understanding, but we lean on God's Word to guide us. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We cannot be responsible for someone else's actions but we are to be prayerful and thoughtful about our own to take count of the consequences as much as we can see them and leave the rest in God's hands. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. What a wonderful word this is. A wonderful Eucharistic word. See, Jesus didn't repay us evil for evil. Jesus fed us, his enemy. While we were still enemies of God, he died on the cross, turning his body into the bread of the Eucharist, turning his blood into the wine of the Eucharist for us. Do you know whose head he heaped burning coals upon? Yours. <laughs> Mine. We were the enemies. And it, we, we were against God and he fed us and he gave us drink when we were thirsty for righteousness sake. He cleansed us. He heaped burning coals upon our heads the same way the angel brings coals to Isaiah's lips and purifies the iniquities of your heart. That's a passage about you. 
How's it feel to have burning coals upon your head? <laughs> it feels mighty good. Thank you, Jesus. It's called baptism. It's called forgiveness. It's purification. That's what fire does. That's what water does. And that's what we do to anyone who is opposed to us. We love them with kindness. Jesus loved with kindness so much that he gave his body and blood. That we could always and forever until he comes back have this meal that we will partake of later on this morning. We will feast on his body as food and we will drink from the cup as the the thirst quenching elixir of life or what you call Gatorade. And so Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to come back around. Gatorade quenches thirst. Sorry. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't know if anyone would track with me on that one. I mean, I didn't want to leave it behind. So Paul comes back around to the beginning of Romans 12. He uses words that are very similar to 12.2. And he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus has overcome your evil with his good. And now we go and do likewise. 